Hey folks, welcome back to the Psychedelic Podcast. This is your host, Paul F. Austin, and today we're diving into the groundbreaking psychedelic legislation in Colorado. Today, I welcome Joshua Kappel, a legal pioneer who's been at the forefront of drug policy reform. Uh, Joshua is also a co-founder of the Microdosing Collective. In last week's episode, we heard about Ali Shaper, and us three, Ali, myself, and Joshua, all started the Microdosing Collective a few years ago. And we talk a little bit about that in the episode today, specifically around what policy and regulation we need to create to ensure that microdoses can become accessible and available to everyone who wishes to use them. So Josh is going to take us on a fascinating journey from his work in cannabis law to his current role in psychedelic policy, including the ins and outs of the Colorado Natural Medicine Health Act and what this means for the future of psychedelic access and regulation. We cover a lot about the licensed psychedelic facilitator program in Colorado to the broader implications around psychedelic policy reform in the United States. And also we go into how healing centers are being regulated in the state's innovative approach to manufacturing and cultivation. So here's a little bit more about Joshua. Josh is a founding partner of Vicente, where he's passionate about building human-centric and regenerative companies in the cannabis and psychedelic industries. He co-authored Colorado's Proposition 122 and chaired the campaign committee for Natural Medicine Colorado. He's also a founding board member of the Microdosing Collective and the Psychedelic Bar Association, and his expertise has earned him recognition in Best Lawyers in America for Cannabis Law, and he's also been named one of Denver's top lawyers. So this is a really detailed conversation. If you're interested about the legislation and policy in Colorado, you're going to learn a lot from this. All right, that's it for now. Let's jump into this fascinating conversation with Joshua Kappel. Josh, it's uh, great to have you on the podcast. Thanks for joining us today live on uh, Third Ways Community Platform. Thanks for having me, Paul. Excited to be here. So Josh, where are you calling in from today? From Denver, Colorado. And what are you doing in Denver, Colorado? Well, Paul, I've been here in Denver, Colorado for, for quite some time. I'm working on various drug policy measures, but we just wrapped up a you know, pretty intensive implementation period for Colorado's Natural Medicine Health Act. Fantastic. Now, where are you originally from, Josh? <laughs> It's a complicated question, but I was born in Minneapolis, lived in California for a little bit, grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, moved to Missouri. I'd been in Denver for the last 18 years or so, um, you know, with, with a small stint in, in California pre-COVID, but for the most part, Colorado is my home. So you were born in Omaha, and one thing, I just interviewed Ali, our co-founder for the Microdosing Collective. All four of us, including John, another one of our co-founders, are from the Midwest. And so I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about what does the Midwest mean to you? What, what, what did you learn or what were some of the values that you were sort of bestowed with from being raised and, and growing up in the, in the Midwest? <laughs> great, great question. You know, the Midwest is it's a really interesting place. I think it's, you know, on one hand taught me sort of that like Midwest hospitality, how to be kind, how to be empathetic, how to care for others. And on the other hand, it taught me that a lot of people don't share my same views of how the world works. And, you know, and there's a big debate, you know, I've been in drug policy for, for quite some time, you know, starting in college. I went to Truman State University in the middle of nowhere, Missouri. And I had a big conflict of, do I stay here and try and like make this state better? Or do I go move to a state where it's actually more possible to make more meaningful change? And I chose I chose the latter um, and, and moved to Colorado. And so why Colorado? Why did you pick Colorado as a specific place to, to go? What what attracted you about Colorado? Um to be honest, it was the day I graduated from college, I got accepted to the University of Denver's law school. And I applied to the law school really late, not knowing um, what exactly I wanted to do with myself. I was very passionate about drug policy, but you know, there's a couple of different paths I was looking at. And the University of Denver accepted me the day I graduated. I had a lot of friends that moved out here. I was tied in I'm with some you know, prominent leaders in the cannabis scene. So everything just seemed to fall in place. And, and off, to, off to Colorado, I went. 
And so you've been, you helped to start a law firm that's now called Vicente, which has been a leading law firm in the psychedelics and cannabis space. And so you went to law school at the University of Denver. You come out of law school. What year did you graduate from law school? 2010. So you come out of law school. Colorado is on the verge of legalizing recreational cannabis. Tell us a little bit about that moment of time in 2010. Why is it that you chose to, to, to help kind of be an early pioneer in the cannabis uh, legal landscape? Yeah, it actually starts a couple of years before 2010. Um, you know, there's sort of a pivotal moment in my legal career. Like every summer when you're a lawyer, you're supposed to get a, a internship or a law clerkship somewhere. And ideally, if you want to be a big, bad lawyer, you go work at the the biggest law firm out there. Um, and I had this inflection point of, you know, I, I could go work at this big firm and make a lot of money, but I also had this opportunity to go work at this nonprofit sensible Colorado, I think make like $2,500 for the whole summer. Um, and so one was like fighting for like medical cannabis patients and medical cannabis patient rights. And the other one was making a bunch of money as, you know, as like a big corporate lawyer. And for better or for worse, you know, at that moment, like I went, I took the risk, you know, I took the risk to put my whole legal career on the line. Um, because, you know, at this time, I'm like, hey, I'm going to go work at this cannabis nonprofit. Cannabis wasn't cool yet. It, people were still going to jail, you know, by the hundred thousands every year. And, and I took that risk and that risk of starting to go work at this nonprofit, Sensible Colorado, um, really is what gave me the, um, both the confidence and the opportunity to you know continue to work in drug policy reform as a, you know as I graduated from from law school and so you know come 2010 you know we were pushing um, to create the the country's first state regulated um, licensed medical cannabis system and and we were successful in doing that through this nonprofit I was working at. And I turned to my mentor at the time, who's now my one of my law partners. I said, Brian, we have to start a law firm. We just wrote a very ridiculous law around regulating medical cannabis. And a lot of the regulations are based off of fear. Everyone's so scared of cannabis at the time. And, and to the yeah, let's do it. And so he's like, I know this guy, Christian Cedarberg, and the three of us off we went to start this law firm. And, and our goal at the beginning was like, how do we leverage capitalism to end drug prohibition? Like, how do we represent the leading members of the cannabis profession while also being at the table changing the laws? Um, and now I think there's like questions of like, hey, should you leverage the ending cannabis prohibition to end capitalism? But that's like a whole nother podcast. Okay, so you're you're at this you're at this precipice of medical cannabis. And I want to hear a little bit more about that. Because when I think of Colorado, I think of legal recreational cannabis. Why, why did it start with a medical cannabis sort of regulated program? My understanding was California had uh, legalized medical marijuana in 1996. How was it that Colorado was sort of the, the first in 2010 to actually um, do that? I'm, I'm a little confused there. Great question. Um, you know, so California was the first in legalizing medical cannabis. And Colorado actually legalized medical cannabis in the early 2000s. In 2010, um, you know, there's this sort of weird federal policy flux. So the federal government is raiding certain medical cannabis businesses. And Obama gets elected. And everyone is like, in, you know, full of hope. And Obama comes out with a statement that says, if you're in clear and unambiguous compliance with state law, we'll leave you alone as the federal government. And he creates this first like policy of tolerance. And so then what we did is we took that and said, okay, how do you create clear and unambiguous compliance with state law? Well, you have a license that says you can do what you, you know, you're allowed to do what you're doing. And so we created the first state regulatory system, the first licensing system for medical cannabis. What does that mean? And and so then what that meant, you know, at the time was if you wanted to sell medical cannabis, you had to get a state and local license. You had to meet, you had to, you had to, you know, 
you had to apply, you had to meet certain background checks. You know, at the time, they prohibited certain people from being owners. You had to have a license from your local government. That means your location had to be in the right zone. You had to have the right security systems. You had to have the right safes, the right cameras. And it's the list of goes on of all these different regulations that the state put, put in place to sort of make cannabis safer. And a lot of times it's really to like address the unknown um, sort of harms or really a lot of, it was really fear-based regulation on those early days, um, you know, but that was sort of about what we had to do to convince government bureaucrats to allow for the sale of a product that was demonized for, you know, the prior 70 years. And the reason I'm asking all of these questions is because Josh was very involved with the writing of Prop 122 for the, or Prop, yeah, Prop 122. Yeah, Prop 122. For the, the Natural Medicine Health Act in Colorado for psychedelics. So I'm, I'm just doing my best to lay some groundwork here to, to better understand what was it that Josh and Vicente in Colorado learned through cannabis that uh, could then be applied to the psychedelic space. And, and that's what I want to transition into, Josh, and spend the majority of our, our time in conversation. So Josh and I first met at Wonderland, uh, the inaugural conference in 2021, RIP Wonderland. And um, Josh, we met through Ali Shaper, who's our co-founder for the Microdosing Collective. And I remember our first conversation, we were just sitting at a high top outside the, the main auditorium, sort of getting a sense for what it is that we'd both been up to and kind of what our perspectives were on the space. And I came to realize that Josh had been very involved with the Natural Medicine Health Act. And, you know, he was working on this basically campaign to ensure that Colorado could become the most forward-thinking state to legalize uh, psychedelics. And so I'd love to go a little bit deeper into that story. You know, psilocybin was decriminalized in Denver in, I believe, 2019, uh, and then fully legalized with Prop 122 in 2022. And so how is it that, or when did you decide personally, but also at a professional level with Vicente, to start to look into the possibilities of supporting uh, a legalized, regulated uh, environment within psychedelics? Yeah, you know, great question. And so, you know, from like the medical cannabis days, we've then moved into the recreational cannabis days and ran that out of our office and, you know, started to build this like whole new industry for better or for worse. And, and I became a little jaded as an attorney. You know, it's like we, we had this success I became jaded. And, you know, one day, you know, one day this um, lobbyist walks in my office and she says, hey, there's these people that want to decriminalize psilocybin in Denver. And I look up from my desk and I'm just like, that is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Like, no one has ever done this before. Like, no one's like, no, like, uh, absurd. But like, are they organized? She's like, yeah. I'm like, are they passionate? She's like, yeah. Like, are they going to make the ballot? She's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, send them my way. And so, you know, it's like Kevin Matthews and Travis Tyler Fluck and some others from the Denver Decrim campaign, me and Courtney Barnes, who's a great attorney who used to work for me at the time, you know, meet with them and we helped them craft the first sort of like city-based measure to decriminalize a psychedelic. And you couldn't really like decriminalize a psychedelic from a city level because it wasn't a crime. But we did what we could. We prohibited funding. We set up a review committee. We made it the lowest law enforcement priority. And then sure enough, that measure passes. And we're all surprised. I, you know, thinking like, oh, 45%, you know, I'll call out a victory. It passes and it sets off this wave of local reform. Um, you know, and you see Oakland move next and you saw other sort of communities start to like take up similar measures. Meanwhile, Oregon at the time, um, you know, with the Eckers, the same chat that are pushing measure 109, which is also another historic measure to create access to psilocybin services or psilocybin care in, in the state. So what we then did is, you know, after we passed this measure in Denver, like, hey, how do we do this statewide? And so we brought people together. It's not without controversy. We did what we could. And we started working with a new approach. Um, you know, Graham Boyd and Ben Unger at the time and Rance and Poland realized, hey, we could put together a statewide measure that creates access to psychedelic care, both in a regulated model and a regulated setting and through community use and personal use. And so we, we, put, we put together this model. 
Um, it was me, Tamar Todd was the lead drafter, Ed Ramey, Sean McCoster came in. And, you know, and we drafted the Natural Medicine Health Act, um, Prop 122. And, then, and it was a really you know, groundbreaking measure. At some point, we, we decided, we we're debating, it's like, oh, should it be psilocybin or should we like, add in some other psychedelics? And no one's ever tried like, a statewide measure with multiple substances. And we're like, yeah, well, let's add in you know, mescaline and let's add in ibogaine and let's add in DMT. And, and so we added in all these other substances. We made an exception on mescaline, excluding peyote you know, you know, at the request of the statement from the Native American church. Um, but you know, but we added in all these other substances. Like, how do we create access to, like a broader range of natural psychedelic, natural psychedelic medicines? You know, so it was you know deeply involved in drafting that. Um, then I was you know, chair of the campaign committee, more as a figurehead because we had a lot of really good paid consultants who were you know really running the campaign. Um, and then I've been working on implementing the law, which has been way more work than the campaign. Um, you know, for the last 18 months or so, or 20 months, um, through my role as a, as a policy advisor to the Healing Advocacy Fund. And I want to get into implementation, but I want to save that for, for the majority of our conversation. What I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about is what, is, what are some of the distinctive differences between the Prop 109 that was passed in Oregon to legalize psilocybin and the Natural Medicine Health Act in Colorado? And what did you learn along the way after seeing what Oregon did to develop what I believe and you believe is actually a, a much better system for the legalization and regulation of uh, plant medicines? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I believe our Colorado system is better. Um, but you know, what the Natural Medicine Health Act did, there's really three pieces of, of what this law did. And two of them are are very new compared to Oregon. You know, so our you know the first piece that was similar is we set up a license a licensing system to license psychedelic facilitators to provide um, natural medicine services and what is called in Oregon is psilocybin services, but Colorado is more broad. Um, at, you know, at a licensed healing center or other approved location. So you know. And we tasked an advisory board to make rules. We, we tasked the state agency to regulate it. And so this like safe access model is very similar to Oregon, um, but different. You know? and, and the big difference is there is eventually we could add in other natural psychedelic medicines. Um, and we also allow for, for services to take place outside of healing centers or service centers. You know, we allow facilitators to go to a, a participant's residence and potentially other locations as well. And then three, we, we created a tiering system for facilitators. So there wouldn't just be like a one facilitator fits all um, system. You know, we actually sort of mandated that the state create like a multi-tiered system. And, 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 we can, and we'll dive into that tiering piece there because it's really important. So that's like piece one. But the biggest piece we did that's different than Oregon is we decriminalized the personal and communal use of all these natural medicines. And we said, hey, anyone who's over the age of 21 is allowed to possess, to cultivate, to share, to manufacture DMT, psilocybin, psilocin, uh, mescaline, off and peyote, and ibogaine. And there's been some modifications. You can no longer share ibogaine, and you can't use dangerous chemicals in manufacturing, and you can't cultivate in more than a 12 by 12 square foot area. Um, you know, so there's like some limitations, but we had this big personal use section that Oregon just didn't have. And really, that personal use section came from conversations with a lot of grassroots activists on the ground in Colorado. Um, you know, really making sure that we had multiple paths to access psychedelic care. It wasn't just going to be a regulated model, but there was also a community-based healing model. And we also designed it too, so there could be like limited sharing of remuneration or money in that sharing. So it's like you know, so you could have an ayahuasca circle where the shaman can be compensated for their time. You know, there's no sales allowed, but it was very important to us to like decriminalize what was currently happening in Colorado's psychedelic community and not like set up a system that's like, oh, uh, you know, everyone has to change what's going on. Now we did on the personal use side, there's like limitations on advertising and there's like some other limitations, but that was like very important to us to like create access to community healing. And then the third piece that often gets overlooked is we create a bunch of civil protections for using natural medicine. So we create these civil protections um, that 
you know, protect someone who has children. You know, you can't lose your children for using natural medicine. You can't be denied um, health insurance for using natural medicine. You can't be denied an organ transplant for using natural medicine. You can't be denied any sort of like public benefit that's not required by federal law to be denied. Um, you, you can use natural medicine if you're on probation and parole. Um, you know, you can't necessarily, and this is a little bit of a gray area, but there's like, you can't use natural medicine at work, but there's like some other laws that protect like lawful off-duty conduct. You know, so we sort of created a lot of civil protections so people who are using natural medicine um, wouldn't lose their jobs or wouldn't lose their children or wouldn't lose their house. And there's actually, and then the other piece of that too is we also protected professional licenses, professional That's license the next part that I was going to ask. Yeah. You know, so I'm using natural medicine in part, you know, self-interested as a licensed attorney, you know, there's like pr protections in the law, but also like licensed professional counselors or physicians or psychiatrists. And, and granted, everything's still illegal under federal law. So there's like some legal complications depending on, you know, if you're a DEA prescriber, there's, there's some you know, additional complications to the extent you're using or participating in the natural medicine space. Um, but for the most part, under state law, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of protections. All right. So this is, so can you just repeat those three again, the three kind of high level di yeah. distinctive differences? So you know, we created a regulated system like, like Oregon. We built upon it in different ways, made it more accessible, made it broader. We decriminalized personal and community use, um, the, sh the cultivation, the manufacturing, and the sharing of a lot of natural psychedelics. And then we created civil protections for those who are using, sharing, or or engaging in businesses related to natural medicine. So a lot of the listeners to this podcast and even some folks who have joined us live uh, are, are facilitators, practitioners, or those who want to become facilitators or practitioners. And so that is sort of the first launching point that I want to get off of because the first I believe it's the first draft of regulations were just published uh, in the last couple of weeks. I'm not sure how you, you, you can probably adjust my language a little bit, but there's now more and more context about if I want to become a licensed service center, this is how I do it. If I want to become a licensed facilitator, this is how I do it. So let's first talk about individuals. Uh, there's two distinct ways to become a facilitator. One is someone who has a clinical license, and one is someone who does not have a clinical license, but still wants to become a practitioner or facilitator. Can you talk in a little bit more detail about for those listening in at home, if they'd like to, to legally work with psychedelics as a facilitator in the state of Colorado, what are those options? How do they qualify potentially? And most importantly, is it only, is it only available to Colorado citizens or is it available to anyone who goes through a training program that is uh, certified by the by the state of Colorado? Yeah, you know, so to start with, a lot of people, you know, we have the regulated side, and we have this like personal use community healing side. We're going to put the personal use community healing side aside for a second, and just talk about the regulated, you know, piece of this puzzle. Um, and you know, you know, so with the not the regulated natural medicine program, there's sort of two agencies that were tasked with regulating it. Um, DORA, which regulates all of our licensed professions, and DOR, which regulates different businesses. And DORA, which also regulates um, physicians and therapists and social workers and stockbrokers and archi archi you know, professional architect plants, whatever. Like they're they're looking at this new. new system and they said, hey, we're going to create this is a mandate. So then they kind of had to create it, but we're going to create this new profession of licensed facility. And then, you know, so we had this new profession under Dora. And through the rulemaking process, you know, they decided that it was best to create two types of facilitator licenses. One is just the classic facilitator license. And then one is a clinical facilitator license. The big difference with a clinical facilitator license is that the clinical in order to qualify for a clinical facilitator license, you have to have another professional license in Colorado. And whether that's you know, you're a licensed professional counselor, you're a social worker, you're a psychiatrist, you're an advanced nurse practitioner, you're a psychologist, you're an MD. Um, you know, so if you have one of these advanced licenses and you 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 know meet and you take the training to become a facilitator, you're now allowed to, to be a clinical facilitator and integrate psychedelic care 
under your facilitator license into your other professional practice. You know, so if let's say you're a licensed psychologist and you also become a facilitator, so now you're a clinical facilitator, you can use psilocybin as part of your psychology practice, you know, with the people you're working with. And you can use it to, you know, depending on the scope of that, of your underlying license, you know, you can treat and diagnose, or you can diagnose and then treat a patient's conditions with psilocybin, you know, and so this sort of integration um, of, psychedelic care into our existing mental health system is a very novel approach. And Oregon is, is not like that at all. Oregon it says actually the opposite. If you have one of these licenses, you cannot actually be a facilitator. Well, it's not that you can't be a facilitator, but you can't overlap them and you can't do both. And so one of our goals during the implementation process was like, how do we you know, integrate this into um, you know, our mental health system? But it was also very important for us that that's not the only path of facilitation. You know, so, you know, the, the, the classic facilitator license, it's still allowed to provide, you know, psychedelic care, natural medicine services. They're just not allowed to treat and diagnose any specific condition. You know, so, you know, so they're allowed to work with folks on a psychospiritual level or consciousness exploration level or, you know, or maybe even, you know, a somatic, you know, there's a lot of different like aspects of, of psychedelic care an indigenous level, a communal level. There's a lot of different aspects of that that don't involve sort of like the medicalization of psychedelic care as well. So you have the facilitator, you have the facilitator, the training is the same. So the training requirements are the same. You know, there's 150 hours of classroom. There's a 40 hours of a practicum in actual um, administrative sessions or psilocybin sessions. And then after that, you get a training license where you can practice on your own, but you have to work, but you're still supervised. And there's like a, like a consultation period for six months while you're in this training license period before you can become a facilitator, whether that's a, you know, whether that's like the classic facilitator or the clinical facilitator. And there's a couple of different pathways too. You know, one of, you know, when we were looking at, you know, how to create this firm, how to make it the most successful, one of our big questions was like, how do we bring in folks who are current facilitators today into this system in the most cost effective and non redundant and efficient manner possible? And so there's a couple of accelerated pathways of licensure. Um, you know, one is for legacy facilitators. So anyone, you know, so if you've been practicing, you know, psychedelic facilitation over a two-year period, at least, like it can't be shorter than two years, and at least 200 hours in you know, psychedelic facilitation, then you can waive all of the training requirements except for a 25-hour class on Colorado ethics and the law. And so, the, um, you know, so that's like one way, we're like, hey, for those who've been working in this space and you want to come in, you should be teaching these classes. Like, you don't need to take that, you know? And so, you know, let's take a class in the law, get your license. There's also another pathway, you know, for clinical facilitators and others who have taken psychedelic training programs before, you know, or who have applicable experience. Like one of the didactic requirements is like 10 or 15 hours on like trauma-informed care. And you might have already taken that many hours on trauma-informed care. So there's ways for approved training programs to transfer in credits you know, of someone's experience in the past. So they could say like, hey, you actually have met 75 out of 150 of these hours. You've met all these hours. And now you just need the practicum. Or maybe like your experience doing clinical trials actually qualifies for the practicum. So you don't even need that. Um, you know, and so there's ways for training programs to sort of like accelerate the licensure of facilitators based off of substantially equivalent experience or education. Okay. So the big, for me, outstanding, this is all phenomenal, Josh. And I'm even learning a lot as we're going along in terms of the nuance of this. Like even the fact that I think in Oregon, you have to complete a full training program before you're licensed. So to allow that sort of, it's almost like a grandfathering in of folks who have that prior experience is going to allow for, of course, there's probably questions about how do you validate that? How do you how do you ensure that's been the case, right? So those will be some of the nuances of how does this actually work, but we won't spend too much too much time on that because I think that's a little too nitty gritty. My, my next question is, you know, we, 
we've been running our own training program through the Psychedelic Coaching Institute. We, we're in our seventh cohort. You know, over 200 people have graduated from our practitioner training program. And there's a substantial number who are in Colorado. I'd say 10 to 15% of folks are actually in Colorado, but 90% of these individuals are are elsewhere. And so I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about if someone lives in California, or if they live in New York, or if they live even overseas, can they become a licensed facilitator in the state of Colorado with an understanding, obviously, that they would have to practice in Colorado to to be legal. But I'm thinking of people who might want to run retreats and sort of fly in from various places and host retreats in Colorado utilizing plant medicine legally. Yes. Um, the answer to that question is yes. And I, I'm sorry I didn't answer it earlier, but there's no residency requirement to become a facilitator in Colorado. You know, there is, you know, if you're a licensed psychologist in California and you want to be a clinical facilitator in Colorado, then you have to like transfer your psychology license over, you know, to like you only you only qualify for a clinical facilitator if you have a Colorado secondary license. Um but yes, anyone can qualify um, to become a facilitator. And you're right that, you know, for those, you, know, you can only really practice in Colorado. And, and maybe that's like at a retreat center, you know, maybe that's at a training program, maybe that's at a healing center, at a private residence. There's like other ways, you know, there's definitely rules around specific practices. Two other things that that reminds me of though, one is if you're a licensed facilitator in Oregon for one year, you can actually just transfer that over to Colorado with no other training requirements. Um, you know, it's our, our Occupational Licensing Portability Act or something nerdy like that. And then two, for training programs, they can actually bring in distinguished educators. And there's a distinguished educator license where you might be, you know, you might live wherever and you might say, hey, I don't actually want to be a facilitator in Colorado, but I want to teach at this training program and you can become a distinguished educator and facilitate um, natural medicine as part of a training program. So one question that I have is then, do you have any concerns about people who uh, go through the licensing process to become a quote unquote legal licensed facilitator in the state of Colorado, just as a way to sort of hang a shingle so they can put it on their website or they can put it on their you know, Instagram, even if they're not actively practicing in Colorado, what, what, what are your sort of thoughts on that process and um, what that might look like? And uh, because one thing that comes up is, you know, there's, there's some nuance in this conversation. Obviously the DEA is not really cracking down on underground facilitators. A lot of people are opening churches to provide some sort of semblance of legal protection, even though most aren't necessarily protected by the law in a considerable way by that. But I can just see a situation where people get licensed in the state of Colorado almost as an additional protection if anything were to happen. Um, and so I'd be curious just to hear from a legal perspective your your thoughts on 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 that aspect or element yeah i mean i have two you know the more people that apply to become facilitators the cheaper the facilitator licensing fees will be because it's a cash funded program so yeah come on in apply never use it but with that said you know if you go and practice in another state and you and you, and you face a criminal consequence you know like something bad happens and you have to report that to the Colorado regulators and you could lose your facilitator license. You know, so I think you have to like balance this question of like, does saying I'm a licensed Colorado facilitator, um, is that worth having another regulatory body oversee what I'm doing in some cases? Um, you know, and so there is, you know, potential risk there. And, you know, but with that said, you know, it's, People who want that training, who want that license, um, it's available, you know. And if you go and break the law in other jurisdictions, like that would risk your license and your own liberty and a bunch of other potential issues. So let's talk about the fees then. And then I want to I want to transition into talking about the service center. I know to apply, you know, we're looking at the application process so we can be approved by the end of this year as an official training program in the state of Colorado. There's likely a few gaps that we'd have to fill as our training program because we've been much more focused on 
the prep and the integration, more the coaching than the actual guiding and facilitation. Um, but I'd be I'd be curious to hear your, you know, and I think it's a ten thousand dollar fee for a training program to apply to become licensed by the state for individuals who are going through this, considering enrolling in a program to become a licensed facilitator. What might additional fees might they sort of have to navigate even after they graduate from that training program before they can officially practice in the the state of Colorado? Great question. You know, so we don't have the fees set yet for facilitators. Um, you know, you know, and there'll be a couple different fees. One will be for like a training license, which we hope to be really low. And then once you have a training license, you're actually allowed to be compensated for providing natural medicine services. Um, but you can't have a training license for more than two years. And then we have you know, the, tr the traditional facilitator license and the clinical facilitator license. And we don't know what those fees are going to look like. You know, will it be $500? Will it be a couple thousand dollars? Will it be somewhere in between? You know, it's really unclear. But, you know, it's like we're all hoping, you know, that there's as low as possible. You know, the, um, the training program fees overall is $10,000 for both like the license and the application. You know, and there's, there's, there's some training program is approved now. Um, but, you know, that's like a yearly or year and a half fee, which, which is expensive. You know, for smaller training programs that, you know, let's say might only have, you know, 20 people in their program or 50 people in their program. Like you can just do the math and figure out how much more that program costs based off of the training program fee. Um, with that said, though, there's not really much we can do because how the system's set up in Colorado and how it's set up with most professions is that they're cash funded agencies. So they, you know, the whole agency, the agency is only funded by the fees. You know, so I think it's like why in some cases we're saying like, hey, we actually. We don't need all these extra regulations because we don't. You don't need all those employees. That's just going to increase the fees, you know. But we'll see. You know, the state on the business side, they have proposed some fees for um, micro healing centers, healing centers, micro cultivation, cultivation, and they're trying to do it in a tiered manner. So their first year fees are like relatively low. All things considered, but then they're like they're saying like oh three years from now those fees are gonna be three times as high. I'm like well that's like very outrageous. Um, so they're like trying to figure out a system, you know, to work with. You know they're trying to figure out a system to like work with everyone, like understanding like and both systems know it. You know or both regulated agencies know it. This is like a small, you know, this isn't cannabis. Like this is gonna be like one percent, you know, at the most the size of Colorado's cannabis market from like a, a gross dollar standpoint. And, you know, so it's like, this isn't, this isn't big business. This isn't like a huge new industry. This is like a modality of care and a modality of healing that a lot of people want to integrate into their existence, existing modalities of care and healing. And so that's the message we've been trying to like carry to the regulators when it's come to fees. So they understand that like the higher the fees are, you're just going to price people out and then they'll just operate how they've been operating for the last 20 years. Right. And that's that's the dance of a lot of this. And it, it's even what we've been focused on helping or supporting through the microdosing collective, which is there's so many black market chocolate bars and microdosing supplements that are out there right now because there hasn't been a reasonable regulatory policy that's been rolled out to actually encourage those people to go from the underground to the above ground. Exactly. And even, you know, in Colorado, which you know has the best state psychedelic law in the country, there's no provision for sales. There's no provision for safe tested products for at home use. You know, there's no provision for wellness or human optimization products that people can take regularly without doing it under the supervision, the direct supervision of a licensed facilitator. And that gap is part of the reason why we started the microdosing collective. You know, it was like, hey, there actually is a huge gap here. Most people use psychedelics on their own, um, especially after they've worked with a guy. You know, and they want to continue to build that relationship with psychedelics. You know, it's like they do it on their own, and 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 that's the you know, the community that the microdosing collective is really looking to advocate for. And, and we still have a ways off. There's a lot of like nuanced issues there, but yeah, we just had a, a team meeting a couple of days ago in LA. So Josh and I were. 
fighting over the one bed in our in our in our friend's uh, in our friend's guest room. And you know, we, Josh's sort of conservative estimate was uh, seven years until we'll see an above ground microdosing regulatory policy, which I think is is totally reasonable. But in the in the meantime, a, a follow up question on that, Josh. Let's say I'm a licensed clinical facilitator, right? I'm a clinical psychologist. Mm-hmm. I do I do therapeutic sessions with clients, and I've discovered that a low dose of psilocybin is actually great for an in-person therapeutic session. This is what used to be called psycholytic dosing. So is it going to be feasible for licensed therapists to provide a very low dose of psilocybin to a client they may work with in, let's say, a two-hour session? And then after those two hours are done, that individual can go home and navigate their everyday lives? Or what are the sort of containers and restrictions specifically for how these lower doses might be utilized that are, let's say, sub-intoxicating? Uh, it's not like it's going to be a full you know, journey where they go deep for five to six to, to seven hours. Yeah, this is, this is a pain point right now in Colorado's regulation. You know, the the minimum amount of time um, someone needs to be with a facilitator is three hours. Um, you know, and, and that's for a dose under 10 milligrams of psilocin. And our Colorado regulations have an interesting calculation of how you convert psilocybin to psilocin. Um, you know, but they're trying to measure everything in psilocin as like the most accurate measurement. Um, but there's a three hour minimum window. And so, you know, we're hoping to change that. The, the, there might be another bite at the apple of changing that in November, but it is like a huge gap, especially when it comes you know, to exactly the scenario that you mentioned. Is like folks who want to work on like a low dose and it's sub intoxicating or sub perceptual or threshold perceptual to the point where it's like they're actually, you know, fine to go after an hour or two hours, and it's and it's. You know, that's what's okay in Oregon. Like Oregon actually has that rule, you know, you know, where you can leave after, I believe, 45 minutes on certain doses. And Colorado just sort of like looked the other way and, and made this like three hour limit. You know, that I've sent in comments to them to change. And hopefully, you know, you know, we can get that change to create more accessibility there. And it actually is really key because like a lot of people want to work with like a very, very small dose first before they step into, you know, a larger dose. And if if the regulations are the same, a lot of people are just encouraged to go straight for the larger dose because they're spending so much money anyways. Um, I will though say one thing we do have, you know, in Colorado around microdosing is, you know, that I think is really huge is just the decriminalization aspect of it. You know, it's like it is, if you're an adult in Colorado, you're allowed to possess microdoses, you're allowed to share microdoses, you're allowed to use microdoses. And we can't say that about any other state in the country, you know? And so from like a microdosing policy standpoint, you know, how I look at it is like, first we have to stop the criminalization of microdosing users, you know, and then we need to create a path for like, how do we give safe access to safe tested products? You know, so in Colorado, we've done that first step, which is a, a step more than any other state. We haven't got to that second step. And so when I look at that seven year model that I, you know, the seven year number you quoted me on, that's for the second step. I hope, you know, even this November, like Massachusetts is going to vote on a similar bill as Colorado that has a decrim portion of it. And they'll have accomplished that first step, ending the criminalization of microdosing users. But they, you know, it doesn't address that second step of safe tested products. So let's talk a little bit about licensed service centers now. I want to do a lot of this conversation on individual facilitators because that's the vast majority of the audience that that's listening to this. But you and I both know there are probably dozens of ketamine clinics that are now offering ketamine-assisted psychotherapy in the state of Colorado. We're also well aware that the FDA just rejected MDMA-assisted therapy, so that will not be rolling out anytime soon. And the FDA isn't really slated to potentially um, approve another psychedelic medicine until 2026, but more likely 2027. And so I'd be curious to hear kind of just how Colorado has set up the system for these licensed service centers, uh, what the details of that are, what the nuances of that are. You had mentioned before that it's not just 
clinics that will have access to this, but also private homes can be a potentially licensed service center. So just bring us a little bit deeper into the, the nuance of who can be approved, what physical places can be approved to actually provide uh, legal psychedelics under the Natural Medicine Health Act. Before I get there, I want to talk about this private home piece. You know, so there's, you know, so there's these licensed healing centers that are regulated by the Department of Revenue. Uh, and there's two different types. We'll talk about those. But side of licensed healing centers, a licensed facilitator is allowed to go to a private residence to provide natural medicine services. But there's a couple of restrictions. One of the participants in that like individual session or group session has to like have a legal right to possess that premise as like a resident. You know, if some, you know, like let's say I could have the facilitator come to my house and like provide me natural medicine services. My house doesn't need to be licensed. There are special requirements though. If if it's you know, if you're going into a private residence, then there either needs to be two facilitators or it has to be recorded. This the session has to be recorded. Um, but you, and there can't be any children present, any other haz- hazard. You have to do a safety check of the premise first. And then, but you can have group sessions at private residences too. So you can have up to 64 people in a group session under the rules. You need one facilitator for every four participants though. So that's like the ratio. Um, and that can happen at a private residence or at a human. Now there's also some rules, but we're trying to clarify these in November of allowing that same system to happen at healthcare facilities and potentially like other commercial businesses as well outside of the healing center license. But I wouldn't count on the healthcare facilities most likely, but other locations, probably not. So that then brings me to, if you want to open up a, you know, if you want to open up a business where people are continuously receiving natural medicine services or psychedelic care under Colorado's law, you need a healing center license. Um, The, and what we advocated for was two things in the healing center licenses. One was, you know, flexibility, and the other one was safety. And so, what, how we set, how we set up the system is: there's a micro healing center license and an, and a traditional healing center license. For a micro healing center license, um, if you have less than 750 milligrams of psilocin, which you know, re- reverse engineer, that's like how many you know grams of how much approximately do you know? I've been telling people like 75, 75 grams of mushrooms, you know, but it's probably more like a hundred, you know, with like the, you know, with the psilocin calculation in there. And, you know, so if you're a healing center, you have less than hundred grams of mushrooms then you don't need a big security system. All you need is a lockbox to keep your mushrooms in. You need a camera that's like focused on the lockbox and you have to like follow the other you know, requirements around record keeping around you know posting some signs you know and there's like some you know having a bathroom that people can use where the bathroom can be shared you know and so that's sort of like this micro healing center license and then if you have more than that amount you know you you know then you just have a normal healing center license and you have to have a full-blown security system now on the healing center piece what we were advocating for and what actually made it into the final regulations was this idea of like multi-use premises you know, so, you know, we didn't, like in Oregon, a lot of the, sort of the service centers are like, you know, dedicated to national service centers. Ours are very different. Like, you know, you can overlay a healing center license onto any other business. Um, you know, you can offer other modalities of care. The restrictions on someone being, you know, un- you know under the age of 21 only apply if there's natural medicine, there, um, you know, in that administration's area, you know, which can then like, you know, be used for other for other systems too. You know, the license holders are not allowed to take regulated natural medicine there, but there's like provision. There's no prohibition on someone having like a personal use or community use like ceremony at these locations. I um, mean, you know, you could have a yoga studio at these locations. You have a you could be a, ther- a therapist office. You know, so it's, the idea is like, how do you? So our big push is like, how do we actually create this as like a license you can overlay on other types of businesses? And the rules like pretty much reflect that. Um, there is a prohibition you can't have your license at the same location as an alcohol license or a cannabis license. Um, but even that, you know, if it's on a large retreat center, like locations defined as is, is, is there's a nuanced definition of it. So you have like one building that's a restaurant and a different building that's your healing center. You know, so that's like the healing center piece. You know, there's also 
you know, a manufacturing license, you know, and the manufacturing license, there's sort of two types of manufacturing licenses as well. One that can just make tea bags and capsules, and then one that can make chocolates and gummies and tinctures. And then there's limitations on what sort of products or additives you can use, you know, use in the creation. There's, you know, limitations on what you can use in the extraction, like they're really encouraging like a cold water extraction. Um, yeah, but there's your specific rules around manufacturing. And then there's a cultivation license that a lot, and, and there's also a micro cultivation license and a cultivation license. Similar sort of cutoff. Um, it's 750 grams of mushrooms a micro cultivation license can store at any one time. And five kilograms of mushrooms, of dried mushrooms, a normal cultivation license can store at any one time. And there's specific rules around testing, um, contaminants and things, you know, with the whole diamond shroom things, you know, they want everyone to test for four ACO DMT now, in addition to some other contaminants. They've required different alkaloid testing for other, you know, for other tryptamines. Um, and there's like specific packaging rules as well. You know, it has to be in childhood packaging if it's going to leave a healing center. You can't market to kids. There's marketing rules. Um, but overall, the whole system is, you know, is really designed to be a closed loop system. You know, licensed products in the system come from a licensed cultivator. Maybe they're manufactured, maybe they're not. Then they, then they can go to the healing center. Two other like key pieces to know. One is like healing centers are allowed to do sort of like lemon teching or mixing at on site. So they can get dried mushrooms and then mix it in and make tea or you know, mix it into another product on site. They don't need a manufacturing license for that. So I think what we'll see at least at the beginning is probably like some micro cultivation licenses with some healing centers. And that's gonna make the main form of ingestion will be you know, some, you know, some tea bowl. And second, you know, is that there's a requirement that every license creates an ESG plan or like an environmental social governance plan. And this is sort of like a novel product, not even a novel, but a novel regulation of like mandating some sort of like corporate social responsibility in, you know, in this system. And what that, and what those rules say is like, you need to choose, you know, you know, an environmental plan, a social plan or a governance plan that like you sort of highlight and make your own and make that publicly available so the public can hold you accountable. And examples of that could be, hey, we have, you know, we have a recycling plan or we have, you know, we're carbon neutral or on the social side, it's, hey, we put in place an indigenous reciprocity plan or we, you know, have a particular like indigenous incubator or, you know, we have special trainings, you know, for our staff by indigenous experts or indigenous peoples. And then like on the third piece on the governance side, it's like you have transparency and there's like different aspects of it. So you, every business has to pick something that they're doing and then make that available. And, you know, it's not like the, you know, it's not the, your strongest regulation, like the, you know, people's, you know, feet aren't going to be held to the fire, but it sort of sets the tone in this space. And we're looking for actors who participate in this space that care more about just the bottom line, you know, and, and, and there's many things they can care about besides just that bottom line, but care about something. And then I guess third bonus piece is there are limitations on public companies. Public companies aren't allowed to hold the license. And anyone who holds a license can't have an interest in more than five licenses. So the idea is like not to have one business and all the healing centers in Colorado, but to sort of like cheat these smaller, hopefully facilitator led. There's a bunch of other, you know, aspects of the rules that I could, you know, that could I think we got, this is, I, I'm starting, I'm starting to get a little like, I think, uh, bored and, uh, and I appreciate the, uh, the, the nuance here because I think it's important. And, and Josh and I connected right before the podcast and I told them, I'd really love this to be a podcast that is shared for anyone who has someone who might be curious or interested about what are these new rules and regulations going on in Colorado. And Josh, you've done such a phenomenal job of going through the details for individuals, of going through the details for manufacturers and also for licensed service centers. So we have about five minutes left. And the, the sort of question that I wanna ask you is, you know, you mentioned Massachusetts earlier in this conversation, uh, how they have a ballot initiative 
in November of this year to legalize psychedelics in a similar way as the Natural Medicine Health Act. We went to Sacramento in April to talk to legislators in California. Unfortunately, it's unclear um, how soon California will legalize psychedelics. And so I'd just be curious to hear your top of mind thoughts of what else is going on from a policy perspective outside of Colorado? What other states do you think are, you know, looking to potentially legalize psychedelics in the next, you know, three to five years? Yeah, great question. You know, right now, all eyes are on Massachusetts as sort of you know, the next state that has a ballot measure in November. So November 2024, you know, if you're bored with the presidential election, turn in, check the results of Massachusetts and see, you know, see what happens. You know, I'm betting that it's going to pass. I think the public really wants access to psychedelic care, um, but we'll see. You know, so that's something to watch. You know, you have a lot of states have passed with like research related bills or like quasi access bills you know utah's one they created a system that like i don't know if it'll functionally work but it's like a really good statement you know, texas passed a bill it's like allocate funding for research you know you have different research related bills you know kind of all over the country i mean you have a couple of task force bills you know the most active task force i know about is in washington um you know there's a lot of you know a lot of movement and conversations there, like what does a regulated program look like in Washington? I would, you know, I, I, I'd keep an eye on Washington. And New Jersey has a, a, a very narrow psychedelic um, therapeutic bill um, that is, um, you know, it's run by like, the Speaker of the House, I think is like a lead sponsor on it. There's, there's a chance that that moves forward. I, you know, I'd watch that. Um, New York introduced a bill that I find to be the most fascinating from a policy standpoint, um, because it sort of bucks the trend of a of creating supervised access to psychedelic care and says, "Hey, anyone should be able to access psychedelic care for, you know, for treatment or for wellness." And so their model says, you know, if you qualify, their model says like if you qualify, then, you know then you have to take a four-hour class. And with that four-hour class, you're like a psychedelic user permit. And with that psychedelic user permit, you're allowed to cultivate um, and possess certain psychedelics. So that's like a really interesting model that creates a more accessibility and, and kind of like a lighter touch and also acknowledges that most people who use psychedelics don't do so in a supervised setting. Now, I will say like the first time you use it, or if you're using a high dose or a new substance, like please like don't do it on your own. But after you've like developed a relationship, a lot of people want to continue to develop that relationship. And I think New York's model um, sort of reflects that reality on the ground. And then you also have, you know, everyone's looking at California and sort of like wondering what to do next. You know, this bill, you know, the decrim bill was vetoed by the governor that then led, that just decriminalized psychedelics and led to this regulatory bill. That bill ended up dying. Creating more regulation in California is actually more complicated than you might think it would be. And then, you know, now there's a question, like, hey, should there be a ballot measure? If so, what does that look like? Should we go back to the legislature? Um, you know, so there's a lot of eyes in California and a lot of people having conversations about like, what is the best path to create access here? And, and you know, and I think kind of like stay tuned and, and, you know, see what that looks like. Yeah, we're hopeful for a ballot initiative in the state of California. We're also well aware of how expensive it is, but it feels like at this point in time, with how uh, gridlocked the legislature has been around it, that a ballot initiative may have some uh, capacity to be successful. So Josh, that brings us to time. We've been going live for an hour. This, this was a fantastic deep dive into the Natural Medicine Health Act, how you know your work in cannabis helped to set some of the groundwork for what you were able to help bring to life through the Natural Medicine Health Act, as well as a little bit of context on, on what's going on in other states. If anyone is listening to this, if you want to get involved, we'd encourage you to go to microdosingcollective.org. That's the nonprofit that Josh, myself, and Ali Shaper have started to support legal above ground uh, use of microdoses of psilocybin mushrooms. And you, you can become a member or a donor at microdosingcollective.org. Uh, there's also a great article on psychedelic alpha that goes into more detail about the Natural Medicine Health Act that was written by Vicente, the, the law firm that Josh is a partner in. So we'll link to that in the show notes if you want to go and have a deeper dive 
into some of the rules and regulations of Colorado. And Josh, any other places that you'd like to point people before we close out today? Well, you have to think of the state houses that go through those who want to get involved in implementation in Oregon or Colorado or soon to be Massachusetts on the regulated model, the Healing Advocacy Fund. Um, you know, it's a good organization to, to look up as well. And stay tuned. You know, I you know, with the sort of setbacks at the federal level, which we for folks who've worked in cannabis forever, who's always doubted and the, the the federal government would ever catch up to what the world the people want. Um, the state access model seems to be you know the path forward. Uh, you know, I, I think we'll see a lot more development there. And you know, as Paul said, the ballot measures are um, what we're hoping for because the people are generally lead on this issue, and politicians are scared of the unknown. Stay tuned. Microdosingcollective.org um, is definitely the best spot to get involved. And thank you so much, Paul, for having me. Thank you, Josh. And anyone who's still listening and tuning in, let's let's give Josh a big, you know virtual round of applause, or maybe just drop in the chat a a note of thank you or appreciation. We really appreciate him joining us for this live podcast, going into incredible nuance and detail about uh, the Natural Medicine Health Act. We'll also be publishing this podcast live through our normal channel, so you can tune in again if you want to just sort of review a lot of this, because we did cover quite a bit. And uh, Josh, we just appreciate you and and everything that you've done for this space and how you've been a a real pioneer for a lot of the legislation that has had a positive impact in both cannabis and psychedelics. And, you know, our work at the Microdosing Collective uh, would not be possible without your contributions and everything that you've um, brought to it from a legal and policy policy, uh, perspective. So uh, I appreciate you and we appreciate you. And uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And, you know, I'll just leave everyone with this is that the psychedelic space is still yet to be created. And so we're all in this together. Hey, listeners, Paul here. I hope you found our episode with Joshua Kappel as illuminating as I did. Don't forget to check out the link in the episode description for the full show notes and any resources we mentioned today. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on this conversation. Join our community platform, share them in there. You can sign up for free at community.thethirdwave.co. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode, make sure to follow the Psychedelic Podcast wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. And maybe share it with a friend or someone who you think might benefit from learning about Colorado law. All right, thanks for tuning in, and we will catch you next week for another exciting episode on the Psychedelic Podcast. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to stay up to date on the third wave of psychedelics, subscribe to this channel and visit thethirdwave.co, where you'll find plenty of free resources on the intentional and responsible use of psychedelic medicines.